Welcome to the Radio Graphics Podcast. I'm Wendy Gibbs. In case you don't know, in addition to the regular bi-monthly issues of Radio Graphics, once a year there's a monograph issue dedicated to a single subspecialty. This year we'll be seeing a monograph focused on body imaging, past, present, and future, which will be coming out in October. We're looking forward to that. So in honor of the monographs, Ross Frederick and I have chosen two great articles from the musculoskeletal monograph that came out a few years ago. These articles are of general interest, important for all specialties, for the core exam, and important for us as physicians to know in general. I'll be summarizing a paper on metabolic bone diseases with a focus on osteoporosis, and Dr. Frederick will be teaching us about soft tissue infections, like the dreaded necrotizing fasciitis, an entity I know I feared finding in the middle of the night on call as a resident. Actually, I would still fear it now. Let's start with Dr. Frederick's fantastic review of all types of soft tissue infections. Soft tissue infections and their imaging mimics, from cellulitis to necrotizing fasciitis. Infection of the musculoskeletal system can be associated with high morbidity and mortality if not promptly and accurately diagnosed. These infections are generally diagnosed and managed clinically. However, clinical and laboratory findings sometimes lack sensitivity and specificity, and a definite diagnosis may not be possible. In uncertain situations, imaging is frequently performed to confirm the diagnosis, evaluate the extent of the disease, and aid in treatment planning. In particular, cross-sectional imaging, including CT and MRI, provides detailed anatomic information in the evaluation of soft tissues. Imaging findings of soft tissue infections can be nonspecific and can have different appearances depending on the depth and anatomic extent of tissue involvement. Although many imaging features of infectious disease can overlap with non-infectious processes, imaging can help establish the diagnosis when combined with the clinical history and laboratory findings. This article reviews the spectrum of soft tissue infections using a systematic anatomic compartment approach. Radiography is usually the initial examination for patients with soft tissue infections. Findings pointing to possible inflammatory changes include soft tissue swelling, effacement of fat planes, and skin discontinuity in the setting of deep ulcers. However, these findings are nonspecific and can be seen in other settings, such as trauma, venous insufficiency, DVT, and systemic causes of subcutaneous edema. The presence of gas in the soft tissues or the identification of foreign bodies generally raises concern for underlying infectious processes. Moreover, radiography can help exclude other causes of soft tissue swelling, such as underlying fractures. CT is useful in assessing soft tissue infection in the emergency department. Compared to other modalities, CT provides higher sensitivity for detection of soft tissue gas and foreign bodies. MRI has become the mainstay imaging tool for the diagnosis of soft tissue infections and provides excellent anatomic and pathophysiologic information about the extent and degree of involvement of both the soft tissues and the underlying bone. Now there is some ambiguity regarding the designation of the fascial layers. In this summary, we will use the term deep peripheral fascia when referring to the fascia that surrounds the muscles. We will use the term deep intermuscular fascia to describe the intermuscular septa, which extend deeply from the peripheral fascia. Superficial fascia is a term used by surgeons, but is imaging occult. Let's discuss the types of soft tissue infections. Cellulitis is a non-necrotizing infection limited to the subcutaneous tissue hypodermis, and superficial fascia without muscular or deep fascial involvement. Cellulitis is usually a clinical diagnosis. However, imaging can be performed in the setting of rapidly progressing disease or severe systemic manifestations to detect underlying deep tissue extension and possible localized collections. MRI demonstrates diffuse linear or ill-defined soft tissue thickening with increased T2 signal. CT of cellulitis shows infiltration of the subcutaneous fat and, like MRI, can demonstrate underlying abscesses. However, these findings are all nonspecific and can also be seen with non-inflammatory causes of soft tissue edema, such as congestive heart failure, diabetic vascular insufficiency, lymphatic obstruction, 
and venous thrombosis. Clinical context is key. Moving on to tenosynovitis, which refers to inflammation of the synovial membrane surrounding a tendon. It can result from infection, systemic inflammatory arthropathy, crystal deposition, or overuse. Infectious tenosynovitis most commonly results from direct inoculation from a puncture wound or contiguous spread from adjacent infections. The most common site of involvement in the musculoskeletal system is the hand and wrist. MRI is the preferred modality for evaluation of tenosynovitis, although it is insensitive in differentiating possible causes. The presence of gas or complex tenosynovial fluid favors an infectious cause, whereas multiple joint involvement with associated tenosynovitis suggests an inflammatory or crystal-induced arthropathy. MRI shows fluid distending the tendon sheath that is associated with thickening of the synovial sheath and intense enhancement on post-contrast images. Infectious tenosynovitis is considered a surgical emergency, particularly in cases of acute bacterial flexor tenosynovitis of the hand. If left untreated, it may be complicated by osteomyelitis, tendon necrosis, or stenosing tenosynovitis. Bursitis refers to inflammation of the bursal cavities. The pathologic processes leading to bursitis may include direct trauma, overuse, gout, inflammatory arthropathies, particularly rheumatoid arthritis, or infection in the case of septic bursitis. Superficial bursae, such as the prepatellar or olecranon bursae, are most commonly involved, often due to direct transcutaneous inoculation due to penetrating injury. Deep bursal infection is less common and typically occurs hematogenously. On MRI, the involved bursa is distended by complex fluid that contains internal debris and septa and is surrounded by minimal peribursal edema. Gas bubbles in the bursa may be seen as punctate foci of signal voids. Post-contrast images show a thick enhancing rim surrounding the low signal intensity bursal fluid collection. If there is enhancement of the overlying skin, then accompanying cellulitis is invariably present. Now let's discuss the most heinous soft tissue infection, the dreaded necrotizing fasciitis. Necrotizing fasciitis is a rapidly progressive infection of the deep soft tissues with a high mortality rate. It is associated with intravenous drug abuse, chronic debilitating comorbidities, and peripheral or vascular disease. Necrotizing fasciitis usually starts with inoculation of bacteria and the deep soft tissues following a skin surface breach due to penetrating injury, injection, or surgery. Establishing the diagnosis is challenging and requires a high index of clinical suspicion. Pain is generally out of proportion to the degree of skin involvement, which is a helpful clinical clue to differentiate necrotizing fasciitis from less serious conditions such as cellulitis or erysipelas. On MRI, the key finding is high T2 signal intensity along the deep fascia, especially the deep intermuscular fascia, such that absence of T2 signal in the deep fascia essentially excludes necrotizing fasciitis. The characteristics of involvement of the deep fascia strongly associated with necrotizing infectious fasciitis include 1. Extensive involvement of the deep intermuscular fascia not just the area contiguous to the deep peripheral fascia. Two, thickening of the fascia measuring three millimeters or more at stir or fat suppressed T2 weighted imaging. Three, involvement of three or more compartments. And four, low T2 signal in the deep fascia with corresponding non-enhancement on post-contrast images. It should be noted that high T2 signal intensity in the deep fascia while sensitive for necrotizing fasciitis is not specific and can be seen in other entities such as non-necrotizing inflammatory fasciitis, cellulitis, post-radiation changes, ruptured popliteal cysts, and inflammatory myositis. Skeletal muscle infection, or pyomyositis, is usually caused by hematogenous spread and transient bacteremia rather than direct extension from an adjacent soft tissue infection. It affects people with predisposing factors such as diabetes or immunosuppression. In the majority of patients, pyomyositis usually involves a single muscle, 
but multiple site involvement is present in up to 40% of cases. The muscles of the lower extremity are involved more frequently, with the quadriceps muscles being the most common site. On MRI, muscle edema can be the only abnormality in the early stages. In the next stage of pyomyositis, intramuscular abscesses can be identified. In fact, an intramuscular abscess is the hallmark of pyomyositis. Surrounding inflammatory changes are usually disproportionate and more extensive compared with the size of the abscess itself. This is in contrast to soft tissue tumors, which usually produce less inflammatory change in the surrounding soft tissues. The article then discusses soft tissue infection mimics, which can be caused by autoimmune disorders, perineoplastic syndromes, trauma, muscle denervation, neoplasm, radiation, drugs, and toxins. In the case of early subacute muscle denervation, MRI findings include diffuse T2 hyperintense signal within the muscles and normal T1 signal and absence of subcutaneous edema. Okay, let's do a brief recap. Imaging is useful in cases where soft tissue infection cannot be confidently diagnosed clinically. The imaging findings of soft tissue infections can be nonspecific and can also be seen in the setting of non-infectious conditions. Again, clinical context is paramount. Great, all about the clinical context, got it. That was a great review. We all see soft tissue infections, no matter what our subspecialty or practice. And determining the severity and necessity for emergent treatment can be so hard. All right, my paper focuses on diseases that may not be so fear-inducing, but are extremely important as they still cause substantial morbidity and mortality, especially osteoporosis, which is not only way more prevalent than most people think, but also more dangerous and has a huge socioeconomic cost. Imaging findings of metabolic bone disease. Metabolic bone diseases are a diverse group that result in abnormalities of bone mass, bone turnover, bone growth, and mineral homeostasis. These diseases have many causes, from genetic disorders to nutritional deficiencies to acquired conditions. The imaging manifestations are also varied, and the same disease process can have a wide range of skeletal findings. That kind of sounds familiar. Let's start with osteoporosis, the most common metabolic bone disease. It's characterized by diminished but otherwise normal bone. An osteoporotic state may arise either when bone formation is inadequate or when bone resorption exceeds bone formation. Osteoporosis is most often generalized, but may be a local phenomenon as in the setting of disuse. The imaging features depend to some degree on the rate at which osteoporosis develops. This article provides us with some interesting history and population health information. In 1994, the World Health Organization defined osteoporosis as a bone mineral density that is 2.5 or more standard deviations less than that of a young, healthy adult. So this is a T-score of negative 2.5 or less, as measured with DEXA, dual energy X-ray absorptometry, for postmenopausal women and for men older than 50. This definition was a radical rebranding of several concepts. In science and medicine, an individual is usually considered to have an abnormal result if their result is two standard deviations away from the mean of their age and sex match norm, which is measured by the Z-score. However, for predicting fracture risk, it's more meaningful to compare an individual's bone mineral density to that of a young, healthy individual prior to the occurrence of bone loss than to that of an age and sex match norm. So in this case, the T-score is used to compare the patient's bone mineral density to that of a young, healthy reference population, and is an absolute quantity, not a relative one. Osteoporosis is a huge public health risk. 50% of women and 20% of men over the age of 50 will have a fragility fracture related to low bone mineral density. Of these, 20% will die within one year, and another 20% will need permanent care. And the tragedy of this is that there are very effective treatments. If osteoporosis was identified and treatment could be started before the fracture, we could prevent all this. There's screening, but unfortunately it's underutilized and increasingly so because of issues with reimbursement in healthcare, as well as general lack of knowledge. 
Also, the very rare side effects associated with the treatments have scared many away from pursuing this route. Okay, back to the disease process. Several disorders can interfere with bone formation or promote bone resorption, leading to secondary osteoporosis. Hypogonadism and the resultant acceleration of bone resorption are absorbed in conditions that include hyperprolactinemia, disorders of energy imbalance such as anorexia nervosa, and the female athlete triad disordered eating, osteoporosis, and amenorrhea. Also, primary gonadal failure, as in Turner syndrome or Kleinfelter syndrome, and hypothalamic or pituitary dysfunction. Hyperthyroidism and hyperparathyroidism can cause accelerated bone resorption as well. Growth hormone deficiency interferes with bone formation. Hypercortisolism, whether iatrogenic from exogenous glucocorticoids or from Cushing syndrome, is another important cause of low bone mineral density. Regional osteoporosis can also occur because of inflammatory arthropathy, or immobilization, or complex regional pain syndrome. Weight-bearing bones have little cortical bone. The vertebral bodies are composed of only about 5% cortical bone and 95% trabecular bone. Here, the vertical weight-bearing trabeculae are thicker, and the horizontal trabeculae are thinner, and are preferentially lost early in the disease. Recent work has demonstrated that bone strength is related to structure in addition to bone mineral density. Loss of the horizontal trabeculae results in a decrease of load-bearing capacity, more than the loss of cross-sectional area even, because of the important role that the horizontal trabeculae play in supporting the vertical trabeculae. This article doesn't talk too much about how we image these patients, and I doubt many of us read the DEXAs, so I think that this will be the subject of a future podcast. Really, what we need to be diligent about is watching for fragility fractures. There are a number of papers in literature that cite up to 50% of vertebral compression fractures are missed on radiographs. Also remember, I talked about opportunistic screening in the second March-April podcast. Really important prospects for automated bone quality measurements on all abdomen CTs that have been done for other reasons, capturing that data that's free in those studies. Okay, let's briefly touch on a few of the other entities. Osteomalacia and rickets. Rickets is the interruption of orderly development and mineralization of growth plates. Osteomalacia is inadequate or abnormal mineralization of the osteoid in cortical and trabecular bone. Ingested calcium is absorbed in the gastrointestinal tract, and vitamin D is either absorbed in the GI tract or generated from 7-dehydrocholesterol through exposure to UV light. Vitamin D is further processed in the liver and kidney, where it's converted to its fully active form, which promotes calcium absorption in the gut. Parathyroid hormone acts on the bones and the kidneys to increase serum calcium levels, and high serum calcium levels, in turn, suppress parathyroid hormone secretion. Parathyroid hormone, calcium, and phosphorus also modulate vitamin D metabolism in the kidney. Ah, nightmares of medical school. But this is all important. The radiographic findings observed in rickets are most prominent at the sites of greatest growth, including the knee, like the distal femur, proximal tibia, distal tibia, proximal humerus, distal radius and ulna, and the anterior rib ends of the middle ribs. The findings are observed on the metaphyseal side of the growth plate because unmineralized osteoid is concentrated along the metaphyseal side of the growth plate. Failure of mineralization leads to disorganized chondrocyte growth and hypophosphatemia leads to impaired apoptosis of hypertrophic chondrocytes, which results in excessively long cartilage cell columns and the radiographic findings of widening of the growth plate and cupping and fraying of the metaphyses. Looser zones, also called pseudofractures, are a type of insufficiency fracture and a distinctive feature of osteomalacia. These are the result of deposition of unmineralized osteoid at sites of stress or a long nutrient vessel. These zones can occur with no or minimal trauma and are often bilateral and symmetric and appear as transverse lucent bands oriented at right angles to the cortex that only span a portion of the bone diameter. Some of the common locations of looser zones are similar to those of stress fractures, such as the inner margin of the femoral neck or the pubic rami. However, looser zones also occur in non-weight-bearing bones, which are atypical locations for stress fractures, such as the lateral aspect of the femoral shaft at the level of the lesser trochanter, the ischium, 
the iliac wing, and the lateral scapula. Hyperparathyroidism is a pathologic state of elevated parathyroid hormone concentrations, which causes increased bone resorption. Primary hyperparathyroidism is a state of autonomous parathyroid hormone secretion by the parathyroid glands and lack of feedback inhibition by serum calcium. Primary hyperparathyroidism is usually caused by a parathyroid adenoma, but in approximately 10% of cases, it's the result of foregland hyperplasia, and in very rare cases, it's caused by a parathyroid carcinoma. Secondary hyperparathyroidism is more common than primary and is a response to low serum calcium levels. The most common cause is chronic renal failure, in which chronically elevated serum phosphate levels depress the serum calcium level, which leads to compensatory hyperplasia of the chief cells of the parathyroid gland. Renal insufficiency also affects parathyroid hormone metabolism, further increasing the serum parathyroid hormone levels. Secondary hyperparathyroidism can also be observed in vitamin D deficiency and dietary calcium deficiency. In 95% of patients with hyperparathyroidism, skeletal findings are most readily recognized in the hand. The pathognomonic subperiosteal bone resorption in hyperparathyroidism begins at the radial aspects of the middle phalanges of the middle and index fingers as lace-like irregularity and at the distal phalangeal tufts as acroosteolysis. In later stages, the resorption can appear similar to scalloping or periosteal reaction. Subperiosteal resorption can also be observed in the ribs, lamina dura, which is the bone that surrounds the two sockets, humerus, femur, and upper medial tibia. Brown tumors are lytic lesions that result from the parathyroid hormone-driven activation of osteoclasts. Brown tumors are generally solitary but can be multifocal and are at risk for pathologic fracture. Brown tumors commonly involve the facial bones, ribs, pelvis, and femora and can have a large associated soft tissue component. Treatment of hyperparathyroidism may also lead to resolution of brown tumors. Brown tumors were originally described with primary hyperparathyroidism, but now are more common in patients with chronic renal insufficiency and secondary hyperparathyroidism. Renal osteodystrophy refers to the complex findings observed in the setting of chronic renal insufficiency. These include the findings of osteomalacia and rickets in children and secondary hyperparathyroidism. In any given patient, the findings of one or the other may predominate. In patients with chronic renal insufficiency, radiographs may show a diffuse increase in bone radiodensity, a finding that's seen more often in the axial skeleton, which has more trabecular bone than cortical bone. The etiology of this diffuse osteosclerosis is not well understood, although it probably reflects the anabolic effect of parathyroid hormone. Despite the increased radiodensity, the bone is structurally weak and prone to stress fracture. The spine often demonstrates a characteristic striped appearance, alternating bands of increased density along the end plates and decreased density in the central portion of the vertebral body, also known as rugger jersey spine. Okay, last, hyperthyroidism, most commonly due to oversecretion of thyroid hormone by the thyroid gland, either diffusely, as in Graves' disease, or focally, with single or multiple adenomas. The most common skeletal manifestation of hyperthyroidism is osteoporosis. Okay, that's enough for now. There are more diseases in this article that radiology residents must know for the core exam. And really, the rest of us need to know them too. Take a look at these fantastic papers in the print journal or online, and keep an eye out for the body imaging monograph next month. Thank you for joining us. We'll be back in two weeks with more summaries. And join us on Twitter for more cases, discussion, and references related to these topics.